Would you like to make a difference in this world? Would you like to influence friends and family and other people? Would you like our church to impact Whangarei? Colossians 4 verse 2 to 6 is the key to that. Now let me just give you the background. You see, Paul is sitting in prison. He's chained to a Roman soldier. Unfortunately, the Roman soldiers don't bath every day. <laughs> the windows are small and it's dark. Some of the Roman soldiers swear like troopers. Some of them at night snore pretty heavily. Now I would be frustrated. I'd be saying, Lord, I've got to be out there. There's all these churches that need me. I need to get the word out. But Paul sits back and relaxes and he says, do you know the things that have happened to me have actually created a path for the spread of the gospel? So when he's sitting next to the new guy who's just unclicked the chain and clicked himself in and clanked down next to him and he's got bad breath and he says, so what are you in for? Why are you on death row? Now Paul is a murderer, so he's not going to bring that up at this stage. That was 30 years ago before he was a Christian. So he says, well, it's a secret. Uh, what is it? It's the mystery of Christ. It was hidden for ages and generations. But now it's revealed. And the soldier sitting at the end of his seat, this is interesting, I wonder what this mystery is. He said it's called Christ in you, the hope of glory. This guy's never heard of Christ or hope or glory. Glory in the Roman army, but the other two probably not. He says, well, Christ made this whole universe, but then we mucked it up. So he came down, took on a human body, and was executed on a cross for all of our crimes, the whole lot of us. And then three days later, he exploded out of the grave and went back to heaven. But at the same time, he's God, so he fills everything. And I've asked him to come into my heart and fill my heart, so he's in my heart. And... <clears throat> big strong soldier, he can come into your heart too. He can be your hope and your glory. So how do we deal with this? Let's see what Paul's message is. Let's see how he brings this message of hope to the church. Now the way I want to do it is to read the scripture. So we're going to put the scripture up there on the text, on, on the screen. And I would like you to stand for the reading, because Sheila made us do this yesterday. So I'd like you all to stand. And I'd like us all to read it together, so that we're all involved in the reading and then it's more imprinted on our minds. So we'll start reading from now. Continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. At the same time, praying for us that God would open to us a door for the word to speak the mystery of Christ for which I also am in chains, that I may make it clear how I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom towards them that are without, buying the time. Let your speech be always with grace seasoned with salt, that you may know how to answer each one. God will bless that reading of his inspired holy word. Please have a seat. You notice three words underlined. Prayer, or pray, walk, and speech, or talk. So I just want you to remember three words today. Pray, walk and talk because Paul has got to the end of his letter 
The other thing he does in prison in his spare time is to write letters. And I picture him dictating to the scribe. And the scribe says, not much space left, sir. It's nearly finished. Just a few more words. And Paul packs into these verses we've read pure dynamite. Every word counts. Every word has meaning. Every word is specific. And we can summarize this punchline of his, of his whole epistle as how to make a difference and influence people. You'll notice I'm paraphrasing a famous book just slightly. Or three habits of highly effective people. He just wants three habits. Pray, walk, talk. Easy to remember. What about pray? Let's start with prayer. You know, Jesus told a story about how always men should pray and not faint. And he spoke about a, a judge in a certain city. And this judge did not fear God and he didn't respect people. One day a widow comes to him and says, please avenge me of my adversary. Please give me justice. He doesn't care about widows. He says, nah. The next day, he hears the tapping of the stick and the feet shuffling and the dreaded knock on the door and he says, oh, not you again. No, no, no. The third day, the same thing. Get out. No. Finally, after I don't know how long it is, weeks or months, he says, even though I don't fear God, and even though I don't care about people, I'm worried that this widow, with her trouble, with her continuing coming, is going to wear me out. So I'll grant her her request. Now Jesus says to his audience, hear what this unjust judge says. And shall not God avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him? And will he not hear them speedily, even though it takes a long time? It's a paradox. Speedily taking a long time. Speedily in God's time takes a long time for us. His audience are stunned. They've never seen anything like this. Their teacher said, don't bother God too much. Daniel prayed three times a day. That is the maximum you can pray each day. So if you have an emergency at midnight, tough. You've used up all your prayer. Wait till the next day. And Jesus is saying, nag God. Pester God. Be a pain. Cry out to him in the daytime. Cry out to him in the nighttime. Continue in prayer. Don't give up. Don't Worry, don't settle down, continue in prayer. And that's why Paul writes, continue in prayer. And this word means to be strong. This doesn't mean strong towards God. I command you, you must do this. No, he's saying be strong in persevering with your respectful request to God. Just keep going back. You know the squeaky wheel gets the oil. Just keep pestering God. You've been praying for that son of yours for five years and nothing's happened. Keep pestering God. Keep nagging. You've been praying for the church and said, I've prayed for years, nothing's happened. Well, God's starting to answer prayer. Keep praying. Your prayer is needed. Your nagging is actually a sign of faith because he says, when the son of man comes, will he find the faith on the earth? Or will people have just given up praying because... Nothing's happening. So Jesus is saying, continue in prayer. Paul is saying, continue in prayer. It's a sign of faith. But he also says, and watch in the same. One moonlit night, the moon is kind of playing on the leaves in the garden of Gethsemane. Jesus says to his disciples, my soul is sad even to death. Please wait here while I go and pray over there. 
The disciples sit there and soon they're snoring. Jesus comes back. What, could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray in case you enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the, prayer, but the, the flesh is weak. Now, I want anyone who has never fallen asleep while praying, could you please stand up? I commend your honesty. I'm only standing up because I have to, otherwise I'd be sitting down. You see, when we pray, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Because you're fighting gravity. There's a little piece of flesh called levator palpebri superiores. Can you say that after me? Oh, no, don't bother. It means the muscle that lifts up your upper eyelid. This tiny muscle is fighting the enormous force of gravity. How's it supposed to win? So you're sitting there. I'll just see if anyone's having that problem this morning, just to check. <laughs> How's the levator palpebri superiores? No, looks, looks all good, they're all working. Gravity's not winning. And it's terrible. And you sit there and you think, I've got to pray. And, and it's worse when it's a serious emergency and you've been up half the night because your children are so sick and you feel, I must pray before I go to bed. And next thing, there's this calm, delicious, beautiful sleep and you're on a, on, a, on a lovely island in the sea and the waves are crashing. It's also beautiful. It's very hard to wake when we pray. That's why Jesus says, continue in prayer and watch. And Paul is saying, watch in the same. But you know, it's not just the force of gravity that's stopping us praying. There are some even more powerful forces. They are as strong as a black hole. Do you know they now make 75 inch television sets? That's a 75 inch black hole that is sucking you in. And you're wide awake but you're in oblivion for hours and hours and hours. And you think, look at the time. I've missed the bus. <laughs> and then there's that little iPad. And then there's the laptop. And even the humble little cell phone. They have a power you cannot believe. Now they're very good and they're tools. So when you go home today, I want you to speak sternly to your TV set and say, I am the boss. You are the tool, and I will tell you when I need you. And you just go off when I tell you to, and you stay off. Because we must be in control of these powerful forces that want to suck us into Never Never Land. It's only at this point that Paul adds something extra. He says, continue in prayer, so don't give up, and watch, eyes wide open, with thankfulness. Now I have an admission to make. Sometimes when I pray, my prayer is like a very long grocery list. And I list all the items to God, because this is a nice one. You don't have to travel and go around the shops. You just place orders. Bag of potatoes, milk, son's health, blah, blah, blah. And God's the great grocer up in the sky who then takes things off the shelf and gives them to me. And then the next week I'm praying again and I've maybe had a few items that have been delivered but I'm saying, Lord, you said I can nag you and you haven't delivered that healing yet that I've asked for and you haven't delivered that revival yet that I've asked for so I'm just respectfully saying, could, you, could I please have it? I'm, it's just a reminder. And then I think of Jesus one day, ten lepers come to him, and he heals them all. All the horrible skin sores are gone, they heal, the numbness is gone, the face looks back to normal, and they run off. Wow, we heal, fantastic. We're going to show ourselves to the priests, to the doctors, so that we can confirm this healing, that it's not all just in our minds. One of them who's a Samaritan stops and says, wait a minute, I've forgotten something. Do you know when um, your grandchildren are pushed in front of you and the parents are saying, say thank you to Papa and Nana for the lovely 
stupid toy they gave you. <laughs> and he suddenly gets a conscience and he turns around and goes back to Jesus, falls on his knees, and he says, thank you for making me better. Jesus stands there and says, weren't there 10 people healed? Where are the other nine that have not come back to give glory to God? Because when we thank God for what he's answered, we're giving the glory to him. Because sometimes we start to take a bit of credit and we say, I conquered cancer. I overcame so many problems. I rose from nothing to where I am today. And Jesus is saying, just a minute, are you sure you had no help? Didn't I? Uh, remember when you're going to give up? You, I kept you going. So that's why Paul says, continue in prayer, watching the same with thankfulness. It's only now that Paul actually has his own prayer request. And he prays. Now his prayer is not what I expected. I expected him to say, um, what would I have prayed for if I was sitting in this chair? Lord, I pray for a comfortable chair, a, a nice mattress. Uh, please ask the Lord if he could have some Roman soldiers who bath every now and then and don't snore. Maybe if you have strong faith, you'd say, Lord, do you remember Acts 16? Philippi, you sent a mighty earthquake and it shook the whole place. My chains fell off and the door opened and I could walk out and go and preach the gospel again. Lord, couldn't you maybe open the door of this prison? Paul doesn't ask for that. He says, pray for me that God would open for us a door for the word. Paul is saying, I'm not asking for a door for myself. I'm not asking to be released from prison. I'm asking it that the word can get out. And do you think that prayer was answered? That Roman soldier next, sitting next to him heard the gospel. Some of them became Christians and then God opened the door to Caesar's palace because those soldiers had contacts in the palace. Next thing, part of Herod's family, part of his household guard, part of his servants are becoming Christians. But better than that, God opens another door. Paul has got time on his hands. He writes 13 letters, including Colossians. Those letters scatter out across the Roman Empire. And for the last few months, we've been studying one of them. So God answered the prayers much more than if he just made a mighty earthquake, opened the door, and Paul pre preached for another few years. By opening the door for the word, the word gets out and it makes a difference. And I think we should pray that God would open a door for us, that the word can get out to Whangarei. That's what's going to change Whangarei, as the word gets out. Well, so much for praying. You'll notice he said three times, three verses, pray, pray, pray. Three verses on prayer. Now we're going to have one verse on walking. Do you get that balance? We're looking at the tip of the iceberg, but the iceberg under the sea is the prayer. That's what's going to change us. That's what's going to change our church. That's what's going to change our country. And you know what's interesting? Yesterday at the men's breakfast, this is what Graham brought to us. Prayer, prayer, prayer. Isn't it amazing? And the word, prayer and the word, prayer and the word. I thought, you've read my notes. <laughs> I've now got to repeat everything that you've said again. Now, why do we use the word walk? Why, don't, why doesn't Paul just say, live as a Christian? Do you know it's very easy to live and do nothing? If we're just living, we're just taking up space until one day we leave this planet. But if people are walking, if you look at this next picture, you will see a sense of determination. They're heading in a direction and they've got a purpose. When your friends look at you, do they see someone who's just living and filling in the time? 
Or do you, they see a person with a goal and a direction and a purpose? Do they see me walking towards the kingdom of heaven? Do they see me looking for a city that has foundations, whose builder and maker is God? Do they see me walking in honesty and in love and in faith? When they see me and they see us, do they say, we know they're Christians because <laughs> they love each other? That's what people are looking for. But he says, walk in wisdom towards those that are on the outside. For four weeks, Brian's made us sit in that room around glorious food, and he's made us read the same chapter every time. Luke chapter 10. Not once, but twice, three times. Repeat, 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 repeat. And you know what? I think it's starting finally to get into our thick skulls. Go out. Don't expect people to come in and change our church, we've got to get out there. And Jesus said in Luke chapter 10, I send you out as sheep among wolves. We're scared of the outside world. We as sheep have got to go out there. But we've got to walk in wisdom. Have any of you ever seen your sheep on the farm attacking a wolf or attacking a dog? When those sheep dogs nip, nip at their heels, have you ever seen them turn around and bite the dog? I've seen one of the McElhenney sheep biting a horse. That's the only evidence I've seen of a malicious sheep. <clears throat> but apart from that, sheep don't, they don't form a pack and go to the wolf lair and take it on. We go out as sheep among the wolves. So he says, because you're sheep among wolves and you don't have much of a chance, you must be as wise as snakes but as harmless as doves. The road up to our mission house was a kind of just two dirt tracks going up to the main gate. And in the long grass at the main gate lived a black mamba. And he must have been there for most of the seven years we were there. And one of our friends was driving up our driveway and as he drove up, he saw a mamba head appearing on the grass on the right. And he saw the mamba slither, slither, slither across the road. And the head entered the grass on this side. And he looked and said, the tail hasn't left that side of the road yet. And it was a fat, fat snake. The mamba is so powerful that its poison can drop an elephant. So humans haven't got a chance. Mamba can kill many grown men. But you know, not once did we even see that mamba. It didn't come slithering up to our door, open its black mouth and show us its teeth and say, I've come to take you on. Because the mamba is smart. He knows God gave it poison to kill rats and mice and frogs so he can eat them. What's the point of attacking humans? You're just going to get yourself killed. And sometimes when we go out, we may be a bit too aggressive and a bit too argumentative and a bit too... And all we do is annoy people. He says, be as wise as serpents and as harmless as doves. I was talking to someone yesterday who worked for CBMC, Christian Businessman, and he said they were taught to listen to people, listen to their story before they told their own story. And sometimes we just want to dive in and in two sentences crush this. But remember, you're taking on a wolf, so, so be careful. You're a sheep. Be polite, listen to them nicely, see what they have to say. And be harmless as doves. Ever seen a vicious dove attacking the minor birds? Knocking little babies out of the nest like the miners do, killing the babies? No. Miners just coo quietly and calm everything down. We must be as wise as snakes, but as harmless as doves as we walk through this life. And then he adds to it. He says, walk in wisdom to those who are outside. Buying up the opportunities. And this is what happens on the Wall Street stock market. People buy up opportunities. You've got these men in shirt sleeves walking around and ladies in smart business suits walking around, looking at screens, saying, buy, 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 sell, sell, sell. Now, now, now. If we wait two seconds, it's all going to change. Paul's saying you've got to be a stockbroker. You've got to be on the lookout for opportunities because we must buy up, not stocks and, sh and shares particularly, but the time. 
Now there's two Greek words for time. The one is chronos, from which we get watch chronometer. And that means the measure of time. That clock starts at 10 and moves relentlessly on till 11. But it doesn't do anything else. We can't stop it, we can't slow it down. You probably wish it would just move on a bit. But there's another word called kairos, which means what we do in that hour. The opportunities that that hour presents. What do we do in that hour? So the next time you have a free hour, think to yourself, Lord, and pray to the Lord, Lord, what opportunities are you presenting me in this hour? What wonderful things can I do? And those can be great things, like maybe the Lord's saying, you need a rest. Go down to the beach, have a walk, relax, and just spend time with me and talk to me as you walk. So we need to be buying up the opportunities, buying up the, the chances. As Galatians says, therefore, as much as we have opportunity, let's do good to all people especially those of the household of faith. We've got to start with our own household and be good to each other. And then the goodness can seep out to the outside world. So we've had three verses on praying. Pray, pray, pray. One verse on walking. Walk. And now we'll have one verse on what we think is the most important, which is talk, speech. One verse. Pray, 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 walk, and then you've earned the right to talk. And if we don't pray, 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 and if we don't walk, our talk will contradict, our lives will contradict the words we are saying. And people will say, the thing they love, what's the favorite thing people like to say about Christians? Hypocrites. They say one thing and do another. So let's get the order as Paul has it in his three Secrets of how to be highly effective. A lot of praying, some good decent walking with good walking shoes, and then we can talk. Talking about long grass, one young man was walking through the long grass, and as he got to a certain spot, he felt a searing pain in his leg. And he thought, I'm young, I shouldn't have a pain in my leg. And he looked down, and there was a big fat puff adder hanging on to his foot. Now there you can see the puff adder teeth. They kind of retractile teeth. They're like this, and then when he's ready to bite, they do that. And they strike with a millisecond. They strike so fast, and this thing would, had sunk its teeth into his foot and was quietly injecting puff adder poison into his foot. So he shook this thing off and ran off to his friends, 14 hours later, he arrived in our A&E at the Mission Hospital. That poison, those few little drops of poison that looked like nothing, had spread through the tissues. And it wasn't helped by a homemade tunicky made from long grass, which was just impairing the circulation further. That poison started killing off little cells and damaging other cells. The inflammation that caused caused water to leak into the tissues. When he arrived, his leg was like a big fat balloon. His toes were like tiny little, you know potatoes when they have those little things, if you haven't kind of kept an eye on stocks in the, in the pantry. His toes looked like those little things on the end of a potato. They turned blue. He had no feeling in his toes. His foot was numb. His leg was threatened. He's going to lose his leg. And he had to be rushed to theater for an emergency operation to relieve the pressure and restore the circulation. Our tongue is a deadly poison. Paul, uh, James says in James chapter 3, every kind of animal, every kind of bird, every kind of serpent has been tamed and is tamed of humans. But the tongue, no one can control. It's an unruly evil, full, look at that deadly poison, full of deadly poison. Because with that tongue, we bless God and we pray and we're wonderful Christians. 
with that same tongue, we curse humans. This is not right. So sorry, I'm bringing you bad news. There is no way you can control your tongue. You can try all the tricks in the book. You will never control your tongue. I wanted to show a video of a puff adder striking, but my technology skills are not that great. But basically what they do, when they're threatened, they arch backwards like this, and they poise, ready to strike. And they won't normally attack unless you threaten them. And we often don't hurt people unless we feel threatened, unless we feel intimidated, unless we feel we don't like these people. And if you watch how quickly it strikes, that is why when you're talking to someone and like reflexly you say something dreadful and sink your teeth into them because your tongue moves at such lightning speed, you can't control it. So I, I could end the talk at that point and say, give up, you can't control the tongue. It's got eight muscles and it makes it wriggle like a little snake in your mouth and it's just waiting for the chance to inject some poison. But Romans 12 Paul said, I beseech you therefore, brothers, by the mercy of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world where the tongue goes crazy, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may know what is that good and acceptable, perfect will of God. You can't control your tongue, but Christ can. The theme of our whole series has been Christ plus nothing is everything you need. If you have Christ in you, the hope of glory, and if he transforms your mind, you'll be able, you won't be able to control your tongue, but he will be able to control your tongue. That's wonderful. It's not that we can boast and say, I'm so good at controlling my tongue. We can humbly say, there but for the grace of God, I'd be biting and poisoning and killing people all the way around. So when you present your body to Christ as a living sacrifice, it includes the tongue. So what is the solution? Paul says, let your speech always be filled with grace. When I was a young boy, we went to the racetrack at Kailami and saw Jim Clark, anyone remember Jim Clark in his green lotus, British? Yes, yes, I see the hands, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, that's a different time you're supposed to do that, aren't you? <laughs> British racing green. And you know, as we left Kyle Army, I saw another car in British racing green, and it was an E-type Jaguar. And as a young boy, I thought, this is the most beautiful, wonderful thing I've ever seen in my life. This is a thing of beauty, a joy forever. That's what the word grace means. If your speech is filled with grace, E-type Jaguars come out of your mouth. <laughs> That's grace. Kind, loving, beautiful words. How do we do that? Well, how did Jesus speak? Because he's the one that's inside you who can produce this. They marveled at the gracious words that flowed out of his mouth. They were just dumbstruck by the amazing words that he spoke. And he fulfilled a prophecy from Psalm 45 verse 2 which says, Grace is poured into your lips. Grace was poured into Jesus' lips and it overflowed to others. If you allow the grace of Jesus to be poured into your lips, it will flow out to others. There was another prophecy that said, the Lord God has given me the tongue of the educated, that I may speak a word of wisdom to him that is weary. There are lots of tired and weary people and they want to hear a word of encouragement, a word of wisdom. With your tongue, you can poison them and make them worse. With your tongue, you can lift them up and they'll say it's worth living another day. Thank you for that encouragement. How can I explain this in other ways about how gracious Jesus' words are? Yes, we must wait on the Lord because he says you open my ear morning by morning to speak as the educated. If you want an educated tongue, take this old, like, you see this Bible of mine that needs to visit the, um, it's really not looking good, I apologize for that. 
Read this every morning. And have your ear open to what God has to say to you for that day. Then your tongue will be like the tongue of a ready scribe, ready to fulfill whatever God wants to say that day. But I can explain it more nicely for the ladies, I think, because Proverbs says, a word fitly spoken, and that's a lovely picture of Jesus with grace poured into his lips, and that's our goal, that's what we want to do. If you can describe it, in a, you can describe it as an ornament, because women love ornaments. It's like apples of gold in bowls of silver. Just picture this ornament. Solid gold apples in bowls of silver. You'd walk in and say, wow, I've never seen an ornament like that. And if you say, well, ornaments are not really my thing, try this one. Proverbs also says in chapter 27, like oil and perfume. are the words that encourage people. So whether you want ornaments or word and proof, these are the sort of words that God wants us to do. And the way it says it, it's the word fitly spoken. It means the word spoken on its wheels. It's like an E-type Jaguar. It just glides into the conversation. Some of us are like bank robbers. There's a conversation going and we just storm in, break down the wall and take over and hold guns to everybody else and say, shut up, I'm talking. Uh -uh. We must listen to what people are saying. God gave us two ears and one tongue for a very good reason. Listen to what people are saying and then when God gives you the right words, let the E-type Jaguar just slide into the conversation. Or the apples of gold, pictures of silver, or the oil and perfume, whichever you prefer. But there's also another analogy. Pleasant words are like a honeycomb. Sweet to the taste and health to the bones. Jonathan was a hero. His army was being defeated. His dad was a useless general. The soldiers were defecting from the army every day. One day, he and his armor bearer took on the entire Philistine army. Twenty men came out to get him, but they came in a narrow path, and they could do the good old one-two approach. Jonathan went like this, oh, passed on to his armor bearer. Oh, onto Twenty Philistines gone. Those who came running just saw all their comrades dead, panicked, and ran. Jonathan led the counterattack. But he became exhausted. He'd been fighting all day, now running, climbing mountains. But he comes into a little wood and he hears bzzz. He looks down and he sees a, a cloud of bees and honey dripping from a honeycomb. So he's clever. He takes his spear and the back end of the spear, he dips into the honeycomb, takes the honey, and the light returned to his eyes and he could continue chasing Philistines, which is what he loved doing. There are people in the church that are battle weary, been fighting for the Lord for a year, great prayer warriors, witnesses, evangelists, helpers behind the scenes who slave and we don't even see them doing it. And they're exhausted. Can't you just take your spear, dip it in the honeycomb and give them, just to say thank you, we appreciate what you're doing. What would this church be without you? Do you know, sometimes we feel, we have this fear that people's heads are going to get big. Now that's not a verse from the Bible. Can I tell you that? That is not scripture. Do not tell people something good because their head may swell. People's heads must be this size by now because we don't like telling people they're doing a good job. Get the spear, dip it in the honeycomb, encouraging words. But you know, words can be gracious and oh so lovely but oh, so boring. And sometimes as Christians, we can just be so loving and gracious and boring. <laughs> so Paul adds, let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt. Add a bit of spice to what you're saying. Because people fall asleep if it's boring. If I talk about myself all the time, people get tired. I've heard that story so often. Are you really telling it again? <laughs> Add some salt. Some people say, I know a good way to spice up my, my speech is with gossip. Because every time I say, have you heard about Mrs. Smith? A crowd gathers and we have such a good time. <laughs> so that's the way I make my speech. I know my speech is boring, but when I'm into juicy gossip, 
pow, people listen. You know, gossip is a little bit like at a cocktail party when the waiter comes along with that tray of microscopic sausages on a toothpick. So, would you like, thank you. It's gone. <laughs> Have another one. It's gone. And they're really quite tasty. And they're quite spicy. So you go home and at two in the morning you wake up with incredible heartburn and indigestion. Because that spicy sausage is starting to repeat on itself. And you know, they may be tiny, but they slow, react, slow release taste. And hours later you can still taste that sausage. Proverbs says, the words of a gossip are like tasty morsels, but they cause indigestion. They go down to the innermost parts of the belly. So that's not a good way to season our... The best way to, to, to so season our words is to read the words of Jesus. Read Jesus' story. See how he told stories. Short words, not long words. Words that paint pictures so that an audience of 5,000 sits on a windy hilltop and they're spellbound. Those are the words Jesus wants us to be speaking Words that make a difference. And he says the reason we do this, pray, 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 walk, talk, is so that we may know how we ought to give an answer to every person that asks us a reason for the hope that is within us. Paul knew to have to stand before Nero one day. Paul wasn't worried about the death sentence. He wanted to know that he could give an answer for the faith that he had. We get caught like a possum in a headlight sometimes when someone th says, you know, who created God or does God exist or why does God allow evil? But if we're listening for God's word every morning, God can give us those words we need to deal with those situations. So how do we conclude? Maybe as I was sitting here, you were thinking that's exactly how I feel. I'm so frustrated. My health is not what it is. I can't get out as much as I used to. I feel like I'm chained to the house. I just don't seem to have opportunities to speak. And when I do, I mess them up. I'm so frustrated. How are we to deal with it? What did Paul say? Pray, pray, pray. And then he said, walk. And finally talk. To end with a question, do you want to influence other people? Do you want to make a difference in Whangarei? Do you want our church to have an impact in Whangarei? The answer is simple. It's on the screen. Pray, walk, and talk. Shall we pray? Our Father, please strengthen us with might by your Spirit in the inner person that we may be able to pray and continue in prayer with thanksgiving. Lord, that we may be able to walk worthy of the calling by which we are called and that we may be able to talk with gracious words that change people's lives. We can't do this ourselves. We can do nothing whatever. But may Christ and the Spirit within us transform us to be the people you want us to be. In Jesus' name, amen.